All right, I'm going to start here and uh, expect a couple more to wander in who haven't already wandered out to uh, whatever happy place they're looking for. <laughs> whatever works. Um, the same disclosures as before. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, flow diverters now, uh, some of the trials that got it launched, um, the little bit of on versus off label, and then I'd I guess I should make that disclosure that uh, certainly going to be talking about off-label uses here and then some of the unresolved issues. Um, you know, the low-hanging fruit for pipeline for flow diverters um, was something that we tend to have a little bit of denial about and that's really just how bad we are with coiling large aneurysms. And, um, I was fortunate enough for most of my practice that I didn't have to coil large aneurysms because we, you know, we had such great surgery with Dr. Spetzler. Uh, he was more than happy to take the large aneurysms, but it was it was never acceptable to me. The the this really predates some of the stenting and some other things, but uh, it didn't get that much better with stenting in, in terms of the recurrence rate for large aneurysms, and it's still pretty terrible in terms of the frequency of uh, recurrence after coiling for the larger aneurysms. So. So that was a big fat target for uh, flow diverters to address. And uh, of course the pipeline is uh, what uh, we came up with for that. And uh, the pipeline is a braided stent essentially, uh, an alloy of cobalt chromium and a little platinum for radiopacity. And depending on how it's deployed, how you manipulate it, you, you can end up with around 30-35% uh, metal coverage when it's, when it's fully and properly displayed. Uh, sized and deployed. Um, you can manipulate it by compressing that a little bit and sometimes get it denser uh, or, or if you oversize it then it's going to have much less flow diversion and probably most of the time you're somewhere close to 20 percent actual uh, porosity. Um, but this was this was one of the very early cases uh, that Fiorella published and I, I uh, get sort of particular pleasure out of showing this because it was the inaugural issue of uh, the Journal of uh, Neurointerventional Society, which you know at the time was uh, the two of them were, were fledgling um, enterprises, and and it was not at all clear that either one of them would survive, either the journal or the device. Uh, but this was the this was the cover picture off of the journal, uh, this aneurysm, and this is of course a giant cavernous aneurysm, and what this picture was showing that was novel for us was that stasis of contrast immediately after placement of the device and the uh, CT scan showing the device, of course, the, the metal artifact, but the aneurysm there and then the patient uh, 10 days later getting a bad headache and, of course, at that time you don't know what's going on. Uh, so she gets another scan and at 10 days you see the aneurysm is completely thrombosed and at follow-up uh, the, the uh, aneurysm is completely gone. So, so it's it's a little bit hard maybe to sort of just appreciate what a uh, paradigm shift that was for us and just uh, how great it was. And uh, the device, of course, and, and the journal have both flourished, so that's pretty great. Um, but the trial at the time uh, was the PUFFS trial, and the original trial, the proof of concept was called the PETA trial, and it was just, a, I think, 20 patients maybe, something like that, a very small number in Europe. Uh, where the devices were, de uh, were uh, first used in humans. And then uh, the formal trial that led to approval uh, was this PUFFS trial, for, which was restricted to uh, aneurysms that were deemed either uncoilable or failed. Uh, and uh, there was 108 patients, 10 centers, uh, really five centers that were active uh, in enrolling patients and a couple others that didn't enroll that many patients. And it was entirely for aneurysms of the petrous and cavernous segment. Um, so nothing beyond the superior hypophyseal um, and no posterior circulation aneurysm. So a very, very smart, very limited target population where there weren't a lot of important branches other than the ophthalmic artery. So that was, that was the strategy. Aneurysms had to be at least 10 millimeters in size and uh, have a neck size of at least 4 millimeters. So these were the aneurysms that traditionally we had, had just... Uh, flail that in terms of endovascular treatment. Uh, it was perspective, it was not randomized, uh, it was sequential uh, 
neurological follow-up, an ophthalmological follow-up, uh, 30 days, 180 days, and then uh, a check-in at 90 days at the three-month period as well uh, by phone. They all were independently adjudicated uh, with a core lab uh, with conventional angiography, looking particularly at the degree of occlusion and the uh, degree of uh, stenosis in the aneurysm and uh, uh, stenosis in the parent vessel, rather, and whether there was any implant migration, because again, that's something that was kind of unknown, whether the device would be stable there. And as I said already, there was a neuro-ophthalmological -ophthalmolo evaluation at uh, six months. So it was a, the endpoints were just a yes or no uh, complete occlusion um, at uh, six months and then at a year, and uh, stenosis greater than 50%, yes, no. So a treatment failure was residual aneurysm or stenosis uh, more than 50% in the, in the uh, stent. So either of those were a treatment failure. And the criteria for approval were uh, comparison to historical controls. Um, safety endpoints were there, whether there's a major ipsilateral stroke, neurological death within 180 days. And this is just the patient flow sort of accounting for the patients. What was in hindsight is still um, surprising and a little bit impressive to me was that uh, none of the operators really had any experience with this device. So the first case you did was in the trial. There was no run-in, no uh, warm-up period. So your learning curve was all within that trial. The devices were quite limited in size. The longest length was 20 millimeters. Um, and um, it was quite a flail, some of the cases, some of the, the giant aneurysms, you sometimes needed you know, several devices just to have enough length to cross them. And it was a, a little bit frightening. It was terrifying. Because uh, you had a device halfway deployed across a giant aneurysm, you, had, you really didn't know if you could get back across it or not. Uh, and so that learning curve was, was uh, it was pretty bold to do that uh, in the middle of a trial. Um, this is looking at the uh, safety endpoints. There were three out of 107 patients that had an ipsilateral uh, stroke. Um, two had ipsilateral parenchymal hemorrhages, which uh, became a huge controversy as to what was going on there. Uh, and then there was one fatality that the etiology was never cleared. Uh, but it was rapid enough, and so it was assigned as a possible uh, neurological event. Those were the major uh, safety events. Um, and at one year, uh, there was an 86, almost 87 percent complete occlusion rate, um, which uh, was, you know, again, impressive compared to the 50 percent failure and remnant with coiling. So that was uh, exciting. And the modified Rankin scores were uh, impressively good, again, for the, the, the degree of difficulty aneurysms. They were mostly giant, uh, or at least very large aneurysms. And in fact, you know, in 20% of the patients, the clinical outcomes were better at six months, uh, unchanged in two-thirds, and worse in only, you know, in under 10% of the patients. So for aneurysms that historically had 20, 25% morbidity mortality uh, treatment rates, um, we were pretty happy with those results. Fast forward five years, we've just, uh, in this past year, had the uh, five-year follow-up for these patients. And as I've already said, we had the follow-up at six months, one year, three and five years. Uh, and the same uh, events were evaluated at the five-year. And if you look at the uh, independent core lab occlusion rates over time, you see this continuous uh, improvement plateauing just short of 100%. Uh, so you've got, by five years, you've got 95% uh, complete occlusion uh, of these uh, very difficult aneurysms. So that's great. Um, there were, during the course of those five years, 15 aneurysms that had remnants, uh, six of which, which went on to be retreated uh, to get to that 95%, and uh, seven of those, uh, seven of uh, nine uh, of those 15, uh, seven of the nine that were available for follow-up uh, showed complete occlusion uh, at the uh, last follow-up. Um, if you looked at six months of the aneurysms that failed, the aneurysms that were not completely occluded, um, their mean size was almost 20, uh, almost two centimeters, and the mean, mean neck size was almost 15 millimeters. So these are clearly, uh, you know, challenging, difficult aneurysms that, that the failures were occurring in. 
one thing that was perhaps um, fortunate, um, you know, that the trial sort of the outcomes looked better uh, for is the fact that uh, a number of parent artery occlusions occurred, but that didn't result in in a lot of uh, neurological morbidity. In fact, six carotids were lost, uh, but that was symptomatic in only one of them, and there was an additional 50% stenosis that wasn't symptomatic. So that could have looked much worse had, you know, just the luck of the draw, if those uh, carotid occlusions had, had all resulted in strokes, I think we'd be having a slightly different conversation about uh, whether or not it was a safe device, and, uh, you know, you have to wonder whether it would have gotten improved. Um, but at five years, of uh, the patients available, 96% uh, had modified ranking scores of two or less, uh, so good clinical outcomes. Uh, deaths, 3.7%, uh, uh, one of those deaths from a malignancy. And the other thing that's kind of interesting is that over time, not knowing what was going to happen, you know, between six months and the five-year point, uh, are there going to be new events? Are there going to be continued thromboembolic events? Is going to be a continued problem? Patients are now just on aspirin, and that really wasn't the case. So there really weren't any new events between year three and year five, and even between year three and year one, there were only 3% of patients that had uh, device-related uh, events. So, so really not a lot of delayed events after that uh, first year. Uh, no delayed neurological deaths, uh, no hemorrhagic or ischemic events after six months. So, you know, once you get past the perioperative and early follow-up, it seems like it's a pretty safe uh, device for the longer term. As I've already mentioned, six uh, were retreated. Uh, what was enormously gratifying at five years was that of the aneurysms that had gone on to occlude, uh, had complete occlusion at six months or a year, uh, no aneurysm recanalizations uh, were ever seen. I don't, I don't know, uh, Aaron or uh, Yash, if you guys have seen a recurrence of an aneurysm that had previously had documented occlusion with a flow diverter. I've, I haven't seen that personally, haven't seen it reported, so that's, that's kind of phenomenal. Um, so good long-term occlusion, it looks like, uh, and no delayed recanalization, as I've mentioned. So that's a, actually a pretty small study, pretty limited, and that's what the device is approved for. So any use outside of that in, in America is uh, off-label devices, and, and uh, probably there's more off-label treatment now than on-label, um, but we don't have the same sort of rigorous prospect of follow-up of that. The company um, was on my disclosure list at the beginning here. Um, was really very responsible. They were they struggled with how to roll this device out and how to roll it out safely, how much proctoring they needed to have and how much follow-up they needed to have in terms of aftermarket stuff. And they really have no control of what happens in terms of off-label usage and they 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 are always harshly uh, they, they have the uh, they're pulled between wanting to sell a lot of devices and the fear that if people get too wild with it and have a bunch of complications then they lose it all together. So so they really struggle with how to manage that. Uh, but in the end, if, if the licensed physician wants to buy the device and do something with it off-label, they don't really have uh, control over that. So that's always a little bit, uh, you know, Frankenstein is, is released, uh, and they can't get him back. Um, but as I said, they tried to be really responsible with this, uh, and so they uh, funded... Uh, a couple of large trials. Uh, one of them was uh, retrospective after the device was approved, uh, looking at, um, now the numbers will be up here, but um, uh, all of the cases that were done on-label, off-label, trying to sort out the complication rate, what was, what was really happening in the real world as opposed to in the confines of a trial. And they also had a prospective registry, which, which proved much more difficult to sort of uh, get the data and get people to, to uh, enroll patients and the, the limitations of that were that they insisted that all patients be included so you couldn't cherry pick and, you know, put patient, this patient in the registry and then skip a couple and put another one. You had to be all in or not. So they, they, they really did try to uh, collect as much data as they could in as, in as uh, honest a way as they could. And then uh, this was all uh, combined together in a pooled analysis with the PUFFS data, which is where all the long-term follow-up comes from. But the, these other two registries were the Intrepid and the Aspire, one retrospective, one prospective. 
Um, so this gives us sort of more real world beyond just the uh, approved indications and in uh, answers in terms of uh, stroke rate, ipsilateral uh, hemorrhage rate, neurologic morbidity, mortality, and the combined M&Ms. Uh, and they had over 1,200 aneurysms treated. Uh, you see this mean size much smaller now, so people right out of the gate, people are starting to use this on smaller aneurysms than, than what it was approved for. And the mean neck size, again, a lot smaller than what was in uh, the PUFFS trial. And when, when you start looking at that big group, widespread usage, multiple centers, uh, the major stroke rate was around 4%, the major hemorrhage rate around 2%, uh, major neurological morbidity just under 6 uh, 3% for mortality, and a combined M&M &M of around 7% uh, from this larger series. Uh, they had 85% occlusion at one year uh, in Aspire and PUFFS. Again, a lot of that data coming from the PUFFS because a lot of the other ones didn't have the follow-up. Um, we looked uh, in Phoenix before I left there at, at our results after the PUFFS trial uh, in the early approval thing. It's, it's, it's a little bit, um, depending on your um, affect, whether you're a, a, an optimist or a pessimist, you, you have days where you think that every patient has a complication and it's all a disaster, and the other days where everything looks great. And so uh, Min Park, now Yasha's partner at uh, UVA, um, put together our uh, complication rate uh, for our single center experience after PUFF. So we're over the learning curve a little bit, still learning. Um, and uh, looking at the results were, and, and frankly, you know, to me it seemed like we were having a lot of complications, uh, but we had tracked these patients prospectively. We had them all consecutive patients. Uh, at the time this was reviewed, we had 126 patients with 137 aneurysms, and uh, we expanded a little bit. I put one in a carotid dissection, uh, a CC fissure, so some clearly uh, off-label stuff in addition to the typical off-label stuff. Um, and uh, Min looked at um, all patients versus those patients who had complications. There really wasn't much difference between them. There was the same sort of age, uh, same sex predilition. Uh, um, I guess sex isn't a predilition, is it? Uh, <laughs> kind of one or the other. Um, and. Um, the demographics uh, in terms of aneurysm size a little bit bigger in the patients that had complications. Uh, the main thing that stuck out was that there were uh, more complications in the posterior circulation group than the anterior circulation group, but um, not a huge difference. Um, and whether it was on-label application or off-label application, it didn't seem to, you know, we weren't having more complications in the off-label uh, cases than in the on-label cases. Um, 40 complications experienced by 33 patients. So, you know, uh, that's a lot of complications. Um, but uh, as it turned out, uh, only four of the complications resulted in permanent uh, death or disability. We had three deaths and one permanent disability. So that was a 3.2%, which actually seems pretty good. So, so what about the other complications? Uh, 36 complications, 29 patients, all of who went on to recover completely. Um, and so the total complication rate was around 30%. My sense of it now is that, is that we've gotten slicker, or maybe it's just I'm watching Steve and Akshay, and they're just a lot better at it, or, or they don't tell me about their complications. But uh, my sense is that we're, we're seeing fewer than we were in that period. Um, but if you start looking at these complications, as I've already mentioned, we had the four major ones with permanent uh, death or disability strokes and one, one contralateral hemorrhage. It was kind of like unpreventable, perhaps unrelated. Uh, but if you start looking at what the complications were, some of them were scary stuff at the time. You know, uh, the vessel dissections, um, patients with difficult anatomy, difficult access, you have to be fairly aggressive, big catheters and small arteries. And so the dissections were kind of, you know, the price of doing business uh, to get access. Groin hematomas, dual antiplatelets, anticoagulation, uh, uh, that's certainly uh, um, not a terrible number of hematomas for, for uh, what you're doing. And then it's the other sort of stuff, a couple of vessel perforations that didn't result in, in uh, any morbidity, um, and then the usual UTIs, uh, urethral trauma. You should probably put your own folies in and avoid that. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, but when you, you look at the list, I mean, it's a lot of complications, a lot of them resolved. I just, uh, until men reviewed this, I had no idea Dr. Albuquerque had so many complications. <laughs> that is a joke. That is. <laughs> um, some device related, uh, you know, a couple side branch vessel occlusions that, that again, didn't result in anything. One intraprocedural uh, occlusion of the device and a um, wire that broke on the, the delivery system. Um, all of these have said temporary complications, displacement of the devices, um, mass effect that resolved, uh, a delayed carotid cavernous fissure. So when you really go through the list and start really counting everything, uh, there's a lot. The other, the other thing that, that was a real theme is that balance between, uh, for antiplatelets, most of the bad things that happened in some way related to your management of the platelets, were either too little or too much, uh, 3GI bleeds, you know, that can certainly be a serious problem, especially if the patient goes to another hospital, uh, gets their antiplatelets stopped, and then uh, has their pipeline thrombose, which um, has happened to me. So, um, again, I think we've gotten better with that as we started um, monitoring the platelets uh, routinely, uh, religiously, and often repeatedly. And, it's, and one of the surprising things has been how often Plate, uh, patient's platelet response will change over time. Uh, and the hyper responders is another uh, thing you really have to pay attention to. I have a, a woman currently uh, treated about a month ago. She came back with platelet reactive uh, units of like eight, which means you know virtually no function. And we dropped her dose in half and the numbers got more reasonable, and then two weeks later she came back, and it was six on taking Plavix every other day, and we just kept doing that, and now she's on every four days that she takes her Plavix, uh, whereas you know, previously we had no knowledge of that, and these people would go out and have hemorrhagic complications. Uh, so, so that is a, an, an evolving uh, science. Um, this is, these are some examples of the complications. This is uh, an example of, of uh, an occlusion of the artery that occurred at the time of treatment uh, from uh, a device that didn't expand appropriately. Again, a diff difficult aneurysm. Uh, probably can't see it very well there, but you can see the device uh, didn't open and you know something you got away with uh, because of a great ACOM. Another complication, this is one, uh, this aneurysm had this sidewall uh, Basler trunk aneurysm and this patient presented uh, just before the device was going to be available to us, and so I actually partially coiled this deliberately and uh, did not stent it because I wanted to put a pipeline in there and brought her back uh, we, when predictably this aneurysm had recurred and um, put the pipeline in, but the distal lead wire got caught in one of the little perforating arteries, and I could not get that out, and I had to break it off to, to get the uh, device out. And there's the little metal distal uh, wire, which luckily I was able to break off. And luckily, you know, it turned out not to be uh, particularly consequential for her. And she, she did have a temporary deficit that recovered. Um, but, you know, uh, a frightening uh, event at the time when you couldn't get that delivery wire out. But in the end, a patient that did well. Uh, this is another example of a misplacement. Um, I, we use this case because it's, it is a sort of a blister aneurysm that recurred after clipping. So there's the clip, and we originally placed the device. I didn't want to have the device in jailing the anterior cerebral artery, and uh, it was a little bit difficult to get it to place there, and it just barely covered the aneurysm. It looked okay, uh, but when it came back, the device had actually retracted a little bit, and the distal neck of the aneurysm was then uh, allowing the aneurysm to continue to fill. A second device put in, and, the, and it's salvaged, so a retreatment. Um, but with, uh, with a good outcome. Some of the other things we started asking questions about is you know, things like, uh, does the ophthalmic artery stay open? And in puffs, it looked like it did. We looked at our own uh, cases. Um, uh, Karam Moon uh, looked at this little series of our cases that had uh, coverage of the ophthalmic artery uh, after the puffs trial. Um, and uh, only looked at patients that had at least six months follow-up to see what was happening. We had 29 patients with 38 aneurysms that had sufficient enough follow-up. Uh, and 92% uh, of the aneurysms were uh, occluded at uh, uh, follow-up. And all but one patient were found to have their ophthalmic artery patent. So occasionally you do 
have the artery uh, go on to occlude, uh, but that had no impact on the vision. And uh, what seems to happen when you cross a major branch or jail a vessel like, you know, if you go into the middle cerebral artery from the carotid and you jail the anterior cerebral, it's a question of what the balance is like, how much you restrict the flow versus what the alternative flow is. So if you, if you jail the non-dominant anterior cerebral artery, it will probably occlude and just fill from the other side. If you jail the dominant one, it'll probably stay open. So it's, it just really depends on what the flow dynamics are. <clears throat> Five of the patients in that uh, series looking at the ophthalmic had uh, minor uh, complications but no morbidity. And so, you know, it suggests that the ophthalmic segment's pretty safe. Uh, the next thing that uh, Karam looked at were uh, cranial neuropathies. Um, so we wanted to look at um, how that was affected. We had 22 patients that had presented with cranial nerve palsies. Most of those, these were cavernous sinus uh, giant aneurysms. Uh, in fact, 13 of them were. And we had uh, relatively short follow-up. And in that time, we had 75% of them went on to improve. Um, and uh, most of them, uh, this is of the cavernous aneurysms, uh, the other 25% uh, being stable. Um, what re things really correlate with, and this is not surprising, is that the occlusion of the aneurysm. If you don't have occlusion of the aneurysm, the mass effect isn't going to go away. Uh, we had two patients in that series whose symptoms did not uh, go away and went on to have bypass for management of their uh, symptoms. So we have a pretty high rate of uh, cranial neuropathies, mass effect symptoms getting better with flow diversion, but it really is dependent on, on having uh, good occlusion of the aneurysm. Uh, another question that you hear sometimes is, you know, what about coiling the aneurysm? Do you coil the aneurysm in addition to the pipeline or not? And this is, uh, I've seen, uh, we've looked at our experience, Min Park looked at this, certainly seen um, other publications, other reviews of this that have come to different conclusions. Um, my personal view of it is if you really, uh, for whatever reason, really feel that you have an aneurysm that you want to occlude maybe a little more quickly, you're not willing to wait six months or a year or even that sort of three years to get to 90 percent, uh, then, then maybe you should coil it or you have a, a, a very direct inflow jet into the aneurysm um, that, that a single device isn't going to really change that jet of inflow, then you, your choices are to uh, put a second device or perhaps coil it ahead of time. Um, and uh, we had just a couple of examples uh, of patients that went on to be uh, retreated, uh, this one without coiling. So again, another, uh, the, I, actually I showed that case already, didn't I? So it's uh, a treatment failure here without coiling. I'm going to skip through that. And then one with coiling. Uh, this was a treatment failure where it was originally treated. Uh, there was an endo leak here that kept it open uh, that allowed uh, catheterization later on and coiling uh, to finally get it to go away. And that was the initial uh, or the retreatment phase where it was coiled. And with the follow up there showing the occlusion after the coiling. Uh, so a second device and coiling. So uh, out of 133 patients, uh, we had roughly half that were treated with coils and half that were treated with pipeline alone. Um, the patients that were treated with coils were uh, on average a little bit larger than the ones that were treated with pipeline alone. Uh, but despite that, the, despite them being larger aneurysms in, in the coiling group, they had a higher uh, occlusion rate that was statistically different. So, so in our experience, you probably did, you did get a, um, a benefit from coiling in terms of the occlusion rate. Uh, other people have not seen that. Uh, I think this is the last thing I was going to talk about was looking at uh, posterior circulation. So that's the other area that's pretty controversial as to whether this device is safe to use in the posterior circulation. Uh, Philippe wrote this up. And uh, at the time, the context was that uh, the Buffalo Group had just published a series of posterior circulation aneurysms that had um, um, a pretty high complication rate. Um, and it just didn't match what we'd been seeing. And at the end of all this, I think it really was all about patient selection. And in the cases that I'll show here, you see, I think we were selecting different cases. And I think that's just incredibly important uh, in the, in, in the uh, posterior, well, in wherever you are, but particularly in the posterior circulation, it's just less, less forgiving. At the time, we had 17 uh, posterior circulation patients extending from the 
you know, the, the vertebral artery uh, all the way up to the basilar apex. Uh, that's not very interesting. Uh, out of that, we had one permanent complication, which is, you know, 6%. Uh, a hematoma after the ventriculostomy with permanent disability. Uh, you have to take the hits for everything that happens, but you know clearly that really wasn't the pipeline's fault other than the requirement for the uh, antiplatelets. Uh, we had uh, follow-up, angiographic follow-up in 14 to 17, relatively short-term average around a year. 80% uh, were completely occluded, uh, and the other 20% uh, were near complete. This is an example of a basilar tip uh, previously clipped so a combination of coils and a pipeline device out the uh, left PCA. And here's the follow-up uh, with the aneurysm uh, looking well treated. This is a Basler trunk. This, this case I love because 10 years earlier I had a, just an almost identical case, just the same size, the same location, the same sort of kink at the VB junction with the inflow. And that, uh, that case was a lady... Uh, grade one teacher uh, from um, uh, Tennessee who was just a lovely lady and uh, but I got to know her very well uh, because every two years I was retreating her and um, you know she she went through all the technologies uh, she started out we just had coils we coiled her it recurred stents came out we said, oh we've got the solution for you we stented her uh, it recurred uh, and then you know, coiled her a few more times, uh, and then pipeline device came out, and we finally got to put a pipeline in it, and that was that was the last treatment she had. But at around the same time, this lady came along. About the same time, I was putting a pipeline in that lady from Tennessee, and this identical aneurysm, and I just didn't want to treat it again. So we added some coils, and then the pipeline, and uh, you know, just like magic, this this one has been stably occluded and has stayed occluded. Uh, I uh, assume still. Uh, so, I, you know, I think the device for selected aneurysms, not the dolichoectatic, but I think it really is pretty safe in the posterior circulation. Uh, you do need to be thoughtful about it. Um, overall, you know, we certainly have a fairly high uh, temporary complication rate in, in my hands, our experience, but fortunately a low permanent complication rate. I think the device really is, is a safe and effective device. Um, and I think the role is going to you know, continue to evolve. Uh, continue to expand um, and hopefully we'll find a way to make flow diverters work for bifurcation aneurysms. Um, I don't think that's out of the question and I thank you for your attention and be happy to address any questions. <laughs>